the headlines of this hour on VCB News. Top Vietnamese leader receives Cuban ambassador. And later on, 14th National Party Congress documents set vision for Vietnam's new era. And in a world news, UN chiefs calls on nations to approve the Pact of the Future. Broadcasting from Hanoi, the capital of Vietnam, VTV News starts right now. Good morning. It is currently 8 a.m. local time, and you're tuning in to 30 minutes of VTV News. I'm Lin Le with the latest updates. Now, Party General Secretary and State President Tho Lâm hosted a reception in Hanoi on September the 19th for Cuban Ambassador to Vietnam Orlando Nicolas Hernandez Gullien. The top leader asked the ambassador to convey his thanks to first secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Cuba and president of Cuba, Miguel Diaz Canel Bermudez, for Cuba's readiness to dispatch experts and doctors to Vietnam, helping the country deal with the devastating consequences of Typhoon Yagi. For his part, the ambassador affirmed that the visit by the state president, Tho Lâm, and his spouse and a high-ranking delegation of Vietnam is anticipated in Cuba, stressing it also demonstrates Cuban high-ranking leaders' will and readiness to constantly consolidate and strengthen the relations. General Secretary of the Communist Party of Vietnam Central Committee and State President Tho Lâm, his spouse and a high-ranking delegation of Vietnam will attend the United Nations Summit of the Future and the 79th session of the UN General Assembly, or UNG-8, hold working sessions in the United States and pay a state visit to Cuba from September the 21st to the 27th. The visit to Cuba will be made at the invitation of First Secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Cuba and President of Cuba Miguel Diaz Canel Bermudez and his spouse, according to a communique of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The preparations for the 14th National Party Congress, including the drafting of the Congress's documents, are currently being led and directed by the Vietnamese Party. During the ongoing 10th Central Committee Conference, recognizing that the Congress represents a new historical milestone in the dawn of a new era for Vietnam's advancement, the Central Committee has emphasized the need for greater innovation in both the form and content of the documents. The 14th National Party Congress is scheduled to take place in early 2026. This Congress holds exceptional significance as it continues to mark a new milestone in the nation's development, looking ahead to 100th anniversary of the founding of the party and the 100th anniversary of the founding of the country. As such, the drafting of the Congress documents sets a new developmental direction for many future terms, with a vision extending to 2045. In his opening speech at the 10th Central Committee Conference held on Wednesday, Party General Secretary and State President Tho Lâm emphasized that the 14th Congress marks the moment the country steps into a new era. The successful implementation of the resolution of the 13th Party Congress is the highest goal of the entire party, the people, and the army in 2025. It serves as the foundation for achieving the strategic 100-year objectives under the party's leadership and moving towards the 100th anniversary of the founding of the country. This goal must be pursued with the utmost determination, the greatest effort, and decisive actions. This is the party's responsibility to the people, to the proud and glorious history of the nation, and to the international community. Prior to this, the Central Committee, the Politburo, and the Secretariat directed the document subcommittees to drop a comprehensive set of documents worthy of submissions to the Congress. The overarching spirit that has been consistently emphasized is that the 14th Party Congress will mark the muscle, ushering in a new phase of the nation's development. In drafting and completing the socio-economic documents, we have followed the guiding principles outlined by the Party Central Committee to ensure the production of high-quality documents that align with our established standards. 
The party central committee has directed that the documents must be crafted at the level of policy guidelines, serving as the essence of past, present, and future wisdom. In particular, the political report must be of strategic significance. Creating high quality the Congress documents with consistent content and comprehensive scientific reasoning is crucial. It ensures the Congress success and provides a strategic blueprint for the nation's future in the new era. Vice State President Võ Thị Anh Xuân participated in the 4th Euro Asian Women's Forum held in St. Petersburg, Russia, via a pre-recorded speech. In the speech at the plenary session, the Vice State President praised the role and positive contributions of the forum, viewing it as a platform for exchanging and sharing opportunities, challenges, and solutions to enhance the role of women in all areas of society. She affirmed that in recent years, the role and status of Vietnamese women have been elevated in all areas of social life, particularly in politics and the economy. The forum will last until September the 20th and features about 100 meetings and discussions. In 2024, Vietnam achieved a ranking in the Very High E-Government Development Index, or EGDI group, with 0 0.7709 points, placing 71st out of 193 countries in the 13th edition of the UN E-Government Survey. Within Southeast Asia, the country rose to 5th place out of 11 states, improving by one position since the 2022 assessment. This marks a significant leap from Vietnam's previous standing at the 86th place in both the 2020 and 2022 surveys, with the 2024 index showing a 15-place improvement. The UN affirmed that the advancement of countries like Vietnam from the high to very high EGDI group shows success in strengthening digital infrastructure, expanding internet connectivity, and implementing the robust e-government frameworks. The e-government survey is based on a number of factors, including online governmental services, telecommunications infrastructure, and adult literacy rates, and digital engagement. Following the new regulation in Circular No. 68 issued by the Ministry of Finance effective November 2, 2024, foreign investors will no longer need to provide a 100% cash deposit before buying shares in Vietnam's stock market. This removes a major obstacle that has prevented Vietnam's stock market from being upgraded from frontier to secondary emerging market status for over six years. Under the new regulations, foreign investors won't need funds in their accounts when placing orders. They'll only have to transfer payment by the T plus 2 settlement date, offering more flexibility. If delays or technical issues prevent timely payment, securities companies will step in to facilitate the transaction on the investor's behalf. Securities companies will temporarily handle the payment for foreign investors at that moment to ensure system safety. Shares will be transferred to their proprietary accounts and subsequently sold in the market to minimize risks. Any gains or losses will be the responsibility of the securities firms. Foreign investors will then settle their obligations with the brokerage firms. With daily foreign trading volume averaging around 85 million USD, each company will only need approximately 1.7 million USD, an insignificant amount compared to their current capital capabilities. In the near future, the State Securities Commission, SSC, will welcome delegations from rating agencies alongside major investment organizations that will participate in assessing the ranking of Vietnam's stock market. Securities companies, based on their capital capabilities and liquidity, will be granted limits by the SSC to meet the trading needs of foreign institutions, estimated at around 10 to 15 percent of their equity capital. It is understood that if most investors can trade without obstacles, then the issue of pre-funding 
can be considered successfully resolved in practice. The earliest timeline for Fetsi Russell to conclude whether Vietnam meets the criteria for an upgrade is September 2025. Currently, Vietnam holds the highest proportion, nearly 30 percent, of total assets managed within the frontier market. Coming up next on VTV News, Central Vietnam prepares for a tropical typhoon. And later on, solutions promoted to maintain growth momentum. Welcome back to VTV News Live. Now, a tropical typhoon made landfall in central Vietnam late on Thursday, subsequently weakening to a tropical depression. The typhoon caused heavy rainfall in many localities from Hà Tĩnh to Quang Chi province. Authorities have implemented response plans to mitigate damage caused by the typhoon. In the border and coastal regions of Guangxi province, the Provincial Border Guard Command deployed hundreds of military officers and soldiers to support residents in low-lying areas. We have evacuated more than 500 households in two border areas. In addition, we have deployed more than 700 officers and soldiers, 41 vehicles, including 31 boats and 10 army trucks to support task forces in low-lying areas. In Guangbing province, authorities evacuated nearly 1,000 households in less lie-prone areas. Guangbing Provincial Military Command ordered all military officers and soldiers to stay on duty around the clock to handle any possible situations caused by heavy rains. A landslide caused by heavy rains early Thursday morning buried six households in Sui Phai village, Mueng La district, Thanh Hoa province. No casualties were reported, but the landslide caused significant damage to the residents' properties. Families in affected areas were evacuated. We went to a relative's house for temporary shelter. The next day we returned home. Our house was swept away. As the storm approached, we coordinated with five border guard stations, the local police and task forces to evacuate residents in landslide-prone areas as soon as possible. Safety and prevention measures have been prioritized in all localities to keep locals up to date with the latest information and provide timely support for local communities. Torrential rain caused by Typhoon No. 4 or Typhoon Sulik have decreased in Da Nang City, but residents in mountainous areas are advised to remain vigilant against the risks of flash floods and landslides. On Thursday, water flowing from upstream caused local rivers to rise rapidly in Hua Bac Commune, Hua Vang District. Authorities carried out response measures to ensure the safety of local communities in hazard-prone areas. The mountainous area of Hua Bac Common have a steep and tough terrain. Therefore, households in vulnerable areas always face high risk of flash floods and landslides. As heavy rains prompted fear and anxiety in residents, seven households in Bay Ho Hamlet, home to the Kutu people, were evacuated to safer places before Tropical Storm No. 4 approached. There is only one drainage ditch on La Cern Tuil Wan Highway. The poor drainage system impedes the flow of floodwaters, leading to inundation in many areas. Floodwaters submerge major roads, flowing into residents' houses. To protect people's lives and properties, we evacuated all households in flood and landslide-prone areas. Hua Vang Common is home to 140 households, most of them live in hazard-prone areas. Authorities have a step-by-step -step removed obstacles for the implementation of relocation and resettlement plans. 
At the same time, they are carrying out various measures to ensure the safety of local communities, including evacuation plans and the establishment of checkpoints to prevent people's travel to flood and landslide-prone areas. The Vietnam Bank for Social Policies, VBSP, has announced that interest collection for borrowers affected by Typhoon Yagi and subsequent flooding will be suspended until December the 31st. The bank has directed its branches in collaboration with local authorities, socio-political organizations managing entrusted funds and relevant agencies to assess the damage sustained by borrowers. Priority capital will be allocated to severely affected areas to provide loans aimed at helping businesses and production recover. The Vietnam Bank for Social Policies will draft a plan and submit it to relevant ministries and the government, proposing to increase this year's credit growth by approximately 199 million U.S. dollars. Typhoon Yagi is the most powerful storm and typhoon to hit the East Sea in 30 years and the most devastating to land in Vietnam in 70 years. It has caused extensive damage to lives, property, livelihoods and business operations. According to estimates by the Ministry of Planning and Investment, the country's annual GDP growth could decrease by about 0.15 percentage points due to the damage from Typhoon Yagi. Over 2,600 fish farming cages are being rebuilt from scratch. Quang Ning has the highest number of damaged cages in the country and suffered the largest economic losses, reaching 976 million U.S. dollars. Although growth may not meet our expectations, we are still determined to aim for double-digit growth. If we can maintain double-digit growth this year, it will mark the 10th consecutive year that Quang Ning has achieved this milestone. FDA Enterprises have also resumed operations and the tourism sector has started welcoming its first groups of visitors after the storm. Ranked second in terms of economic losses is Haiphong, with over 447 million US dollars in damages, equivalent to one-tenth of the city's total revenue last year. Factories are currently undergoing repairs while continuing production and 100% of the seaports in the area have resumed operations. Nationwide, the estimated property damage is approximately over 2 billion U.S. dollars. National GDP is expected to decrease by around 0.15 percentage points due to the storm and its aftermath. The agriculture, forestry, and fisheries sector is the most affected, with a decline of 0.33 percentage points. As reported by the Ministry of Transport, Nearly 4,200 locations are in need of restoration, with estimated costs totaling approximately 117 million U.S. dollars. Additionally, damaged tourism and accommodation facilities are undergoing urgent repairs. Numerous establishments are concerned about the potential impact on the international tourist season, which extends from September this year through to April of next year. Now, despite the predicted lower GDP, Vietnam still experienced an optimistic start from the beginning of the year through September. And that is why the predicted uh, figure will still fall between the projected growth range of 6.8 to 7 percent, according to the General Statistics Office. More to follow. In the aftermath of typhoon damage, the need for public investment disbursement has become even more urgent. As the water recedes, construction resumes. This spirit has been spread to all public investment projects across the country. Many construction units have prepared pre- and post-storm scenarios, ensuring that project progress remains on track. The rate of public investment disbursement is expected to accelerate in the final months of the year. We have mobilized 100% of our machinery and workforce to recover progress achieving 35 to 40 percent of the planned output to ensure the project stays on schedule. According to international organizations, achieving the high growth scenario is entirely feasible based on statistics from the past eight months. Exports have seen a significant increase, especially in the manufacturing and processing sectors, which has led to a surge in industrial production output. Additionally, Foreign investors have increased FDI disbursement to the highest level in the past five years. 
The most promising aspect at this time is Vietnam's export momentum, supported by improving external demand and the easing of monetary policies in other countries. The government has issued Resolution No. 143 with six key tasks and solutions to urgently address the aftermath of Typhoon Yagi, swiftly stabilize people's lives, promote the recovery of business production, actively drive economic growth, and effectively control inflation. From a fiscal policy perspective, the focus at this time should be on budget spending tools that ensure both direct and indirect contributions to economic growth. On this basis, economic activities can recover and become more dynamic. The government's swift issuance of Resolution No. 143 is both timely and well-targeted. The resolution outlines key directions, including solutions for restoring production, ensuring social welfare, controlling inflation, and supporting businesses in post-storm reconstruction. It provides clear and specific tasks for each ministry, sector, and locality to follow. Coming up next on VTV News, UN chiefs calls on nations to approve Pact of the Future. And later on, Russian president extends the Western food import ban. Now moving on to our world news, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has urged divided nations to compromise and approve a blueprint to address global challenges. He told reporters on Wednesday that discussion on the pact of the future are in their final stretch. Failure to reach the required consensus among all 193 but UN member nations would be tragic, quote unquote. Negotiations on the 30-page pact, now it's in its fourth revision, have been taking place for months. The pact includes 51 actions on issues including eradicating poverty, combating climate change, achieving gender equality, promoting peace and protecting civilians, and reinvigorating the multilateral system. Russian President Vladimir Putin has signed a decree extending an embargo on agricultural products from Western countries for another two years. The embargo, which will run from January 1, 2025 to December 31, 2026, marks the first time the extension has been exceeded one year. The ban affects products from the United States, the European Union, Australia, Norway and Canada. The restrictions were later expanded to other European countries, including Ukraine. The import ban has contributed to Russia's agricultural growth, helping the country increase domestic production and reduce its dependency on imports. The Canadian government announced on Wednesday that it would further reduce international student and worker permits. It pointed to the high immigration as straining the country's housing sector, jobs market and social services. In 2025, Canada plans to issue 437,000 study permits to international students, down from 485,000 this year and more than 500,000 in 2023. It will also put new limits on work permits for spouses of international students and foreign workers. In addition, the country will step up checks before issuing travel visas to stem a spike in fraudulent or rejected asylum claims. Canada aims to decrease the number of temporary residents to 5% of the population, down from 6.8% as recorded in April. Estonian athlete Jan Ruse, a three-time world champion in slacklining, walked on a tight rope from Asia to Europe in Istanbul. The slackliner successfully crossed from Asia to Europe in 47 minutes, walking on a 1,074-meter-long special rope. This accomplishment made him the first person to walk between continents on a tight rope. A special 1,074-metre rope was suspended over the bridge, which connects Asia and Europe at a height of 165 metres. Roos successfully completed the more than a kilometre journey in 47 minutes despite strong winds, maintaining his focus throughout. So that was actually a smooth walk. In terms of weather, we're so lucky. 
uh, cars, they kept driving, slowing down a little bit. So I was also slowing down myself just to rest. Meanwhile, it's so much noise. I did not expect. It's like for one hour almost. The Bosphorus Strait, where Europe and Asia converge, links Istanbul's European and Asian sides with its striking waters. According to Jan Roos, the Bosphorus has thousands of years of cultural significance and incredible natural beauty. Combined with variable weather conditions and strong sea currents, it became a unique place for tightrope walking. While walking I was concentrating, just look straight and focus on the step. But at the same time I had moments where I needed to rest my arms, like, because they were getting cramped. And during that time I was able to watch also the old city and the nice view of the city of Istanbul. Roos is the only athlete to have ever landed a double backflip on a slack line, a testament to his technical mastery and daring spirit. His previous accomplishments include embarking on the Sparkline Challenge last year in Qatar, where Roos traversed a lead-lit slack line suspended between the scimitar-shaped iconic towers in Doha's Luzail city. And before I say goodbye, here is a look at the weather forecast. And that is all that we have for this hour on VTV News. To rewatch our program, you can visit our website, our YouTube channel, or download a mobile app VTV Go for more. Thank you for watching, and goodbye for now.